worshiping with you today and to everyone here. Isn't it great to all be in the same room? Yeah. Woohoo! What an amazing answer to prayer that we went into phase two this week. And boy, we had been crying out to God for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, now as we dig into your word, would you speak to us from your word today? Holy Spirit, I welcome your anointing and power to speak through me. Enable me to proclaim the word of the living God. And may it be spirit and may it be life in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Wow. I tell you, I so appreciate our team. We have a great ministry team. Pastor Aaron, thank you. What a great job this morning. Pastor Jesse, Pastor Reagan, Pastor Wanda, thank you so much for your ministry. March of 1620, a Native American named Samoset came into the Plymouth colony. He told them about another Native American named Squanto. These two men had an amazing impact upon the residents of the Plymouth Colony, and made a significant difference in their life. One of the things that they did was they introduced him to the, to the, they introduced the leaders of the colony to one of the Native American chiefs in that area named Massasoit. William Bradford, who was the governor of the Plymouth Colony, who was the leader of the pilgrims that had left Great Britain and first went to Holland before they then made the journey by the Mayflower to the Americas. William Bradford, in his, uh, in his journal that was later published under the title, The Plymouth Settlement, this is, this is how he documented the meeting of Massasoit, the Native American chief of the, of the tribe in that area. Quote, after some time of entertainment being dismissed with gifts, in a little while he returned with five more, and they brought back all the tools that had been stolen and made way for the coming of the great sachem called Massasoit who about four or five days after came with the chief of his friends and other attendants and with Squanto. With him, after friendly entertainment and some gifts, they made peace, which is now continued for 24 years. In then he went on to list six of the points of that peace pack, which I'm not going to take the time to read right now. But some of the historical documents have documented that that, that, that peace pack with the Native Americans went on for 60 total years. And the peace pack was only broken when Native Americans that were beyond that area and had either disagreed with the peace pact from the beginning or had grown tired of it, they came and they attacked the, the Plymouth Colony and, and other, other colonies around there. But what, how different that is from what we often hear. A black brother named Muko Solomon Kagatl, who has a PhD and is professor at the University of South Africa in the Department of Christian Spirituality and Church History and Missology. He's, he's a prolific writer. He has written one paper that is entitled The Influence of Azusa Street Revival in the Early Developments 
of the apostolic faith mission of South Africa. In the introduction to that paper, he writes this, quote, This article demonstrates the influence of Azusa Street Revival in the early developments of the Apostolic Faith Mission, AFM, of South Africa. This will be done by studying the Azusa Street Revival in context, the role played by William Seymour and the characteristics of the revival. The article also studies the influence of Azusa Street Revival on the pioneers of Pentecostalism in South Africa, John G. Lake and Thomas Hesmalach, African Pentecostal, like Elias Letwaba, saying these African names is a little challenging for me here, <laughs> and the Central Tabernacle Congregation. The purpose of this article, the purpose of this article, the purpose of this article is to demonstrate that the main impact of Azusa Street Revival in the early developments of the AFM of South Africa was, the, was its ability to unite people beyond their differences of race, gender, color, age, and others in a hostile political environment and Pentecostal experiences. The greatest capacity for reconciliation and healing of our land is not political and it's not Black Lives Matter. It's Holy Spirit awakening. Amen. The greatest capacity for racial reconciliation and the healing of our land is not political and it is not Black Lives Matter. It is Holy Spirit awakening across our land. That's the greatest capacity. I would love to go into more detail of how in the early decades of the Plymouth settlement, how they influenced and how that influence made a difference in relationships and human sinful heart damaged that on both sides. I would love to tell you and go into detail how they, there is actual documentation of how the Azusa Street Revival in L.A. began to make a huge difference just 40 years after the Civil War, what the Civil War and politics could not do that spiritual awakening began doing up and down the West Coast and into the Midwest of the United States. It began to make a difference in healing of racial reconciliation. And how that every revival has had that kind of an impact. But we're living in a time of historical rewrite. Truth is being displaced and distortion and deception is being propagated across the land. So what, what does the child of God do in the midst of this? How do, how do we handle the fact that distortion, deception, even delusion is becoming the commonplace of our culture how do we walk with that? Well, the Apostle Paul addressed this very thing in First Thess or excuse me, in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Would you turn there with me, please? Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to read the the verses that are on the screen. Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to begin reading at verse thirteen. Holler, amen, for me when you get there. Here we go. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, 
Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You know, this only makes sense if you grasp the context. You, you can't take this passage of Scripture out of its context. And the context of this chapter, it opens with the apostles saying, I do not want you to be troubled by word or by epistle as from us. And then he goes on to talk about the last days. And that in the last days, there's going to be a great falling away. And in the last days, the son of perdition, what we commonly call the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. And that that Antichrist is going to come and there's going to be a great deception that's going to come across the people through power, through signs, and through lying wonders. Through power, through signs, and through lying wonders. Interesting. Interesting. Those three, oh, I wish I had time just to go into those three things. And, and then he said not only that, but because they do not receive the love of the truth, catch that. They no longer love truth. They want to believe the deceiving, the distortion, the delusion. They want to believe that. Just like right now, they want to believe the lies. And then he says, because of that, God's going to send them strong delusion. It's going to get even greater. And he says, and they will believe the lie. What's the lie? The lie that was from the very beginning. You can be God. You can be God. God's lied to you. He didn't tell you the truth. You can be God. And then they're going to have pleasure and unrighteousness. It's going to be just like Jesus said. It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? Two things were going on. One, every thought of their imagination was only evil continually. Can someone say Hollywood and Netflix? I mean, can you believe now Netflix can actually publish and broadcast using children? Really? See, but, but see, every thought of their imagination is only... Can you believe Governor Newsom this week signed into law now okaying pedophilia? Really? Oh, yeah. Dig it out. I'm not lying. See, every, every th this is where we're going. Every thought of their imagination is only evil continually. And, of course, the other thing that was going on was you, you had syncubus and nucubus going on, right? Now, what, what we've got to do is we've got to realize that this is where it's going. It's going this direction. And, and the Apostle Paul, he said, because of this, then he began giving them instructions. That this is going to happen, and this is what you got to be doing. So what was his instructions in view of this? Well, the first thing he said was, you got to stand fast. you got to stand fast. Don't. Yeah, just what you said. But what, is that, what does that mean? What's the meaning of the word stand fast? Well, it literally in the Greek, the Greek word used there was actually a block of granite, a memorial stone, or a, a rock headstone at a, at, at, a, at a grave. So what he is saying is, you have got to be like a granite stone that stands as a memorial. We got to stand. We got to stand. 
I want to tell you, we are, we are watching that happen right now. Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California, and Pastor John MacArthur has been going through a great legal battle with the city of Los Angeles and the courts of California. And it's all about the liberty of the church to worship in the midst of C-19, right? CBS News of Los Angeles reported on September 4th, and I quote, L.A. County and Grace Community Church on August 14th, after it began holding indoor services on Sundays, the church led by Pastor John MacArthur filed a suit against the county in response, and that case is awaiting trial in Burbank Superior Court. MacArthur has argued that he's holding services not to, quote, be rebellious, unquote, but because, quote, our Lord has commanded us to come together, unquote. Attorney Amnon Siegel, who is arguing on behalf of the county, pushed back saying, quote, religion doesn't trump health and safety, unquote. Outdoor religious services are permitted in the county alongside other measures to help prevent the spread of the corona, uh, of, of the of the coronavirus. Once it is safe to return to indoor services and resume other operations, county officials and uh, said coronavirus gathering restrictions will be relaxed. Notice he didn't say will be taken away. Relaxed. Just point that out. But the most recent court ruling was reported in the LA Times on September 10th, just this last week. L.A. County, quote, L.A. County Superior Court Judge Mitchell Beckloff sided with public health officials who took legal action last month to enforce health orders against Grace Community Church, an evangelical congregation in Sun Valley that has been holding Sunday worship services indoors since July 26. Quote, while the court is mindful that there is no substitute for indoor worship in the spiritual refuge of a sanctuary, the court cannot ignore the county health order does not dictate a ban on worship. Does not dictate a ban on worship. Unquote. Beckloff wrote in his decision granting the county's request for a, primary, a, a preliminary injunction. The order remains in effect until the issue is resolved. The order allows outdoor services, which were already permitted under the county's public health order, only if the church follows physical distancing and face covering measures. The order also requires the church to allow county workers to enter its property to post the order and to verify the church is in compliance. The church has not allowed public health workers to view its indoor services according to court records. End of quote from the LA Times. No doubt, there are many Christians and pastors who think, and maybe even verbally say it, well, what is the big issue? Pastor MacArthur, you can hold services outside. What is the big issue? Well, the big issue is the same biblical constitutional issue that I faced in the 1990s in Clackamas County. In Clackamas County, the city of Milwaukee required all churches to get a business license in order to hold church services. That meant every year we had to file an application for a business license to be able to conduct Christian church services in the city of Milwaukee. When I got notice that that had become a ruling in the city, I uh, called and asked the mayor to have a meeting with me in my office. And in my office, I showed him a video done by David Barton and wall builders on the history of the First Amendment of the Constitution, that the government will make no law establishing religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And I showed him that video, about 20 minutes long. When he got done, his eyes were as big as owl's eyes. and looked at me and he says, oh, my. 
And he went back, had a meeting with the city manager, and, and also brought the issue up at a city council meeting. The city manager and the city council did not, did not agree with him. And so I had a meeting with the city manager. I went over with the city manager. And as I said to the mayor, I said to the city manager, the right to license is the right to control. The right to license is the right to control. And do you really want to begin dictating to the churches in Milwaukee what they can and cannot do, how they can and cannot do ministry, what we can and cannot preach? Is that really what you want to do? He looked at me with this smirk on his face, and then these were his words, sue me. You can't afford to sue me. You don't have enough money to sue me. Sue me. I went out, I talked with, with the attorney for the Church of God, and the Ch Church of God attorney said, well, I'm sorry to tell you, he's right, we can't. And I was, I was left with no option but to file every year, and I would file a letter of protest every year with my application. I'd staple a letter of protest to it each year, send in. We didn't have to pay a fee, but that wasn't the point. The point was whether or not we had to pay a fee. The point was the right to license is the right to dictate and control. And that is the same issue that's being faced right now in a major way in California and across our nation. When the government dictates the right to tell you how you can and cannot meet, when you can and cannot meet, they are now assuming an authority over the church that our Constitution and the Word of God limits. And that's what's being faced here. The issue isn't, well, they could, they could hold church outside. Why can't they just meet outside? The reason is because the moment the church gives in to that kind of control, then the government will seize that authority over the churches and it will go further. Let me illustrate for you. Okay, so they can gather outside. But to gather outside, they've got a social distance outside and wear a mask. Really? Okay, well, okay, so they can worship wearing a mask. Oh, oh, that's right. The governor made a law. They cannot sing. See, it, goes, it, it just keeps going further. The government will continue to encroach because the right to label that control is the right to begin to control the church. And that's what they want. In fact, already there are those across the nation who are wanting to say to the church, you cannot preach the biblical position on LGBTQ. You cannot use the word sin. They're, they're, they're wanting. Listen, the, 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 the mayor of Houston tried this about three years ago. She actually passed a law that pastors, all pastors had to submit their sermons to the mayor's office before they preached them. I, this is... Listen, I'm not, I'm not telling you fantasy, and I'm not extrapolating this. I'm telling you exactly what's going on across our nation. The right to dictate is the right to control. That is why our founding fathers made that First Amendment, because they knew what Scripture said. You see, in Scripture, God established four arenas of authority. In scripture. I don't have time to go into all of these arenas of authority, but with each arena of authority, God dictated what the authority was, to what extent that authority could operate, and what the boundaries were. And he dictated one was not to bleed over into the other. Now, when you when when, when you when you look on the screen you will notice that I have the family bleeding over a little bit into the church and the church bleeding over into the government. Here's why. The reason was because he, God said, when you've got a rebellious son or daughter that will not listen to parental authority and is stubborn and rebellious and will not listen, then you take them to the religious leaders. 
and the religious leaders enforce a punishment on them for being rebellious. And then he said this. He said, and the church is to influence the government leaders. The church is to influence the civil authorities. But the civil authorities are not to reverse that. The civil authorities do not step into the church. It's the opposite way. The church is to influence the civil authorities so that the laws that they make and the laws that they enforce are righteous laws. And because righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. God set these boundaries. And in those boundaries, the civil authorities were not to influence and control the religious. And and we have examples in Scripture when the civil authorities tried to step into the religious and the consequences were always very serious and very negative. But for example, King Uzziah, I'll go offer the sacrifice. Well, that didn't turn out very well for King Uzziah. King Saul, when the the prophet didn't get there, King Saul assumed the the, the religious order, and that didn't work well for him either. His his throne came to an end. See, God was saying, don't. There were times when the prophets was preaching things, and the kings didn't like what the prophets preached, and so they began to persecute the prophets. They began to even kill the prophets because of what they were doing, and that didn't go well for them either. Because the government is not supposed to step in and influence the religious. The religious is supposed to influence the civil authorities. And you go into the New Testament, you see the same thing in the New Testament. When the civil authorities began to try and control, it didn't work very well. Because God said, you've got to obey God rather than man. So I'm saying to you right now, John MacArthur and the other pastors that are resisting this, they are right. They are right. They're biblically, scripturally correct. It's not just Constitution, although our Constitution, when you go back and you study how our Constitution was written, the men that wrote our Constitution, they went to Scripture. Why do you think that we have three branches of government They took it right out of the book of Isaiah. And their writings, see, this is the problem. Because history is not being taught right now, people don't know this. But in their writings, in their letters, in their journals, they openly admit they went to Scripture to write our Constitution and our laws. It's biblical. It's biblical. And boy, I got to tell you, if there's ever been a time when we needed to refuse compromising the Word of God, it's right now. It's right now. We've got to. Boy, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing that the, uh, let let me just say this before I go to the next point. If there's ever been a time we needed to stand fast, we needed to be like granite rock. It's the church right now. It's right now. We've got to stand up. We've got to stand fast. We, we must not be moved. We've got to stand. Because, dear ones, listen. The enemy, any time the church has, has backed off a little bit the enemy has taken that as an opportunity and we must not do that we've got to stand rock solid come on amen we stand on the rock upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it the second thing he said was not only not only stand fast but he said you've got to hold the traditions that have been taught Now, what in the world does that mean? Hold the traditions. Well, hold literally means to be strong, to be powerful. The Greek word there 
is to be strong, to be powerful. And it, and it comes with the concept of taking control, of conquering something, of prevailing in a conflict. And so what he's saying is, is listen, you have, you have got to be strong, you've got to be powerful, and you have got to prevail when deception, when distortion, when delusion is, is moving across the land. You've got to stand, and you have got to be powerful, and you've got to be strong, and you've got to prevail against the distortion of truth. Tradition. I won't tell you what the Greek word was because it'll just be Greek to you anyway. <laughs> but, it literally, but it literally means the handing down, the bequeathing. And it's, it's, it's one generation. It's, it's parents bequeathing to their children, bequeathing to their grandchildren. That's the concept. And what he's saying is, is you have got to be powerful. You've got to be strong and you've got to prevail because deception, distortion, and delusion is going to try and steal the truth. But you, it's been handed down to you. And you've got to hang on to that which has been handed down to you. It's exactly what Jude wrote when he said, listen, I wanted to write to you about our holy salvation. But I was compelled to write to you that we must earnestly contend for the faith which has been once and for all placed in the hands of the church. And man, do we, do we need to be doing that right now? Let, let me just illustrate to you how, how the battle is raging. Because when we think about, about, about you know, deception, distortion, maybe you think about the alphabet news or you know, or the the um, the historical rewrite. I mean, we we are watching history being rewritten, and it's being it's being put in the schools as if, it, as if it's the truth. And yet, the history that's being taught is been just being fabricated, just yeah. taken out of thin air and fabricated. Right. Just give you a couple of illustrations. I bet you didn't know that a black man invented the automobile 100 years before Ford. See, I knew you didn't know that. In fact, nobody knew that. Because it didn't happen. <laughs> Folks, listen, uh, you, you, you think I'm kidding, but history is being rewritten severely. Th this whole 1619 curriculum that is coming into the schools is a total distortion of history. But see, the reason they're able to do that is because we're taking down all of our monuments and, and all of our memorabilia. Yeah. And it's, it's being taken down, and, and history is being rewritten. And I'm saying to you that not only is that be happening in the public arena, it is happening inside the Christian church. Major evangelical leaders are beginning to teach a distortion. For example, one leader has stood up and said, he, and this, I've, I'm not taking this out of what I've heard. I've gone back and listened to the sermons myself so that I can speak with authority. It's not taking something out of its context. In, in more than one sermon, he has said this. He has said that, that too many Christians point to the Bible as the foundation of their faith. The Bible has never been the foundation of the Christian faith. And you just go, wait, wait, wait a minute. But you're a major evangelical voice. What, 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 what are you saying? What are you saying? Well, thank God because we know the Scripture says, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for the correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. Yes, the Word of God is the foundation of our faith. Yes. How about this one? Another, another evangelical is, is and, and, and this, this was a Pentecostal preacher, 
if I were to tell you his name, everyone in this room would know who I'm talking about. Same with the first one, by the way. But he's teaching that Jesus Christ laid aside his deity. And, and, and when he was on earth, he was just a man. He laid aside his deity. Well, well, what do you do then with the fact that it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's John 1, 1 to 3. Or how about Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10? In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Distortion. What about the movement that, that has probably a thousand, maybe more than a thousand churches around the world that align with this movement and consider themselves a part of this movement, and yet in one of their publications from, that, from their printing house, they have encouraged Christians to explore the New Age movement because there are truths in the New Age movement that we need to bring into Christianity. Yeah. Folks, listen. Paul wrote in his second epistle to the church at Corinth in chapter 11, and he said, and no wonder, because Lucifer himself appears as an angel of light to deceive Folks, we, we have got to recognize the, these are distortions that are coming into the Christian faith because the enemy not only is distorting in the world and in our schools, he is trying to distort Christianity, to weaken Christianity. And I'm saying to you and I, if there's ever been a time the church has got to get a hold of the Word of God and preach and teach the uncompromised Word of God, it is right now. We have got to be committed to the infallible, inerrant, unchanging Word of God. That Jesus meant it when He said, It would be easier for the sun to stop shining and for the moon to disappear than for one word of God's Holy Scripture to be taken away. The Word of God. We've got to preach and teach the Word of God. Listen, folks, that is why... When we're studying on Wednesday nights and when I preach on Sunday morning, I try to give you a plethora of Scripture because I want your faith not to stand in a man. I want your faith to stand in the Word of God and in Almighty God and His great power. The Word of God. But you've got to be committed. In your heart, you've got to be committed. Amen? Amen. So what do we do? What do we do? I hope I'm not making it too difficult on you up in the projection room. I'm not jumping around too much. So what do we do? How do we apply this in the 21st century in our crazy pagan culture? Well, the first is we've got to refuse to live in fear and intimidation. We will never be able to stand fast if you live by a spirit of fear. Remember what, what Paul wrote to Timothy. See, Timothy was struggling with this. Timothy was struggling with the very thing that some of you are struggling with right now. And Paul wrote to him and said, Timothy, you've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And folks, the church has got to take a hold of that. We cannot live in fear and intimidation. I want to remind you again, Psalm 91 promises us. Come on. If you haven't read Psalm 91 lately, you need to get back and read Psalm 91. I, I, I'll never forget way back in February when we saw this coming, God put on my heart to preach from Psalm 91. I preached from Psalm 91. The very next week, all across this nation, pastors started preaching from Psalm 91. And I thought, wow, God, this is, this is your word to our nation right now. But you know what? I haven't heard that now in weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And what we're seeing is too many people giving in to the fear and intimidation. We cannot live in fear and intimidation. If you haven't seen it yet, you need to get past the alphabet news, and you need to get to some really good 
good sources and realize that the CDC and everyone else has already declared that this was a made-up pandemic. We really don't have a pandemic. We're just having a normal flu season. Yes, a worse-than-normal virus, but it's a flu season. And in many of the years, we've had more people die from the flu than have died from this COVID-19. We're believing a distortion, and we're allowing it to create a spirit of fear, and it is time we stopped it. Come on, live by the word of God. You're a child of God. Come on. Don't live by fear and intimidation. Don't fear man. That's why scripture says that, that the fear of man is a snare. Don't live by the fear of man. Live by the fear of God. Amen? Amen. Here's the second thing. He goes on, he says, not only, not only that, but he's because he says, listen, Father's love is assured. Father's love is absolute. Amen? Amen? You go, but Pastor Dean, I mess up so often. Yeah? So did your kids. There wasn't one of your kids that came home from the hospital and said to you, oh, by the way, Mom, I, I know you're really, really busy. Uh, I, I got this diaper thing. I'll take care of it. In fact, anybody that's raised boys know that boys never give you a, a nice warning when. They wait till the last five seconds because we're having so much fun. What cracks me up is when I see grown men doing that. <laughs> if you're 40 and under, wait till you get into your 70s. You better give yourself a good three-minute warning. But it's, it, it, it's you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. That we think that Father's love for us, Heavenly Father's love for us, is different than our than our human love. We don't get mad and throw a kid out because at five, six years old, they didn't give themselves enough time and they wet their pants. We don't change their pants for them anymore, but we don't. At least I hope you don't, Mom. But we, you know, God God knows that we mess up. God knows that we'll make mistakes. God knows that we live in a human body. That's the beauty of Psalm 103 when he says, God remembers that we are flesh. And his love doesn't stop coming to you because you've messed up. And if you're in this room today and you've messed up, do not be afraid to run back to Father and say, Father, forgive me. I messed up. Would you wash me and cleanse me? His love and grace never stops to you. Not only that, but he's the God of all comfort, the God of all peace. He's the God of encouragement. Do not let fear and intimidation get a hold of your heart. Here's the second thing that he talks about. He says is not only is he, is he he says refuse to compromise the word of God. Stand for the word of God. In your heart and in your mind, would you please anchor deeply in your life that the word of God is infallible, inerrant, and unchanging? Amen. And, and if, you, if you go, well, you know, I really would like to know that. I'd like to be certain of that. But Pastor Dean, I'm just not that certain about it. Can I say to you? I, I've, got, I've got some teaching on this that will help you really get it anchored. Help you really get it anchored. Do not, do not let the enemy steal from you that you can trust the word of God every single time. 
for all generations. And let me, let me say to the young people, listen, young people, you're, you're going to get challenged in this. You're going to get challenged in this in middle school, in high school, and when you get to college, you're going to get challenged in this. Our young people right now are being challenged across this nation. Our universities are almost 100% committed to atheism, and, and they, they, they proudly teach it. They proudly teach Marxism almost 100%. I was reading a study just a couple of weeks ago of how many of our university professors are committed to Marxism, and you would not believe the level of that percentage. Young people are going to be challenged. Let me, let me, young people, if there's ever been a time when you needed to anchor your heart in the Word of God and be committed, this is God's truth, and anything that is contrary to this is a lie, is a deception, is a distortion. Committed to that. Here's the last thing. You've got to be committed to good works. Now, I want to, I want to share something. In my message last week, I had a question come to me this week, a very good question. And it was, it was are, are you, are, do you believe that you have to speak in other tongues to be born again? No. Our spiritual language, our gift of the spiritual language has two distinct purposes according to Scripture. Paul talked about this in his letter to the church at Corinth. The first is, it's, it, the, it's the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's that Almighty God is not, and, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not Holy Spirit coming in you. It's you going into Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes in you and dwells in you when you're born again. You can't be born again if he doesn't. Amen. 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 Baptism of the Holy Spirit is being immersed in the Holy Spirit. When I baptize people in water, I don't get them in the tank here and tell them to open up and pour the water in them. I immerse them into the water, amen? That's baptism. The, the very Greek word baptizo, that's what it means. The, the word historically was used for dyeing a garment. When they would take a garment and immerse it into a vat of dye, and they would leave it there until every fiber of that garment was saturated with that dye, then they would lift it out again, and that garment had been baptized. And Almighty God is saying to you, I want to take you and I want to immerse you in the Holy Spirit so every fiber of your being is saturated with the Holy Spirit and His power because you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not come in you, come upon you. Amen. And the initial evidence of that is speaking in tongues. But that's not the only purpose. The other purpose is Holy Spirit enables you to pray with an authority and a power that you do not have in your natural mind and your natural being. Because through that spiritual language, he says the Holy Spirit who knows the mind and will of the Father is praying the mind and the will of the Father through your tongue using an, a language that you have not learned. It may be an earthly language somewhere on planet Earth. It may be a divine heavenly language that's nowhere on the earth, but because you're a son or daughter of God, it's available to you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it's a power. And I'm telling you, when you pray in your spiritual language, you can move mountains that cannot be moved any other way. Amen. And wow, when you combine that with fasting, and then you fast and you pray in the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, no power of darkness can stand against that. It's a power. I, I go into this in much more detail in this book I've written. It's a catechism on the Holy Spirit. And um, I'd like to give this one to somebody this morning. And so the first hand up that I see, you get it. Wow, that was quick. Come on, Adina. Come on, dear. That was really fast. Wow, I bet you're tough to beat in ping pong. <laughs> we, we have got to stand clothed in the armor of God. 
I daily, would you daily put on the armor of God? I, when, when I'm showering in the morning, I literally do this. Father, I put on the belt of truth. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I put on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Lord, I take up over all the shield of faith. I put on the helmet of salvation. I take up the sword of the spirit. Lord, I fill my mouth with praise and prayer and intercession in the spirit through you. And then I pray the prayer of Jabez. Oh, God, would you bless me indeed. Enlarge my borders, God. May your hand be upon me. Keep me from evil that I would not cause pain. And then I pray, Lord, Lord, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done today in everything that I do. Your will be done today. Lord, give me this day our daily bread. Lord, all of our resources. You're, you're our resource. Provide our resources. Lord, Lord, I choose to forgive any who offend me today. And Lord, Lord, may I not, may I not wound anyone today. And Lord, Lord, keep me from the evil one that I would not sin. Keep me from the evil one. You know, when you pray that, the Lord will literally guide your steps around the snares and the traps that the enemy would want to set for you that day. See, we gotta, we, 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 we've got to become people that say, you know what, I'm going to stand. But you can't stand in your own strength and your own power. You can't do it in your own strength and your own power. You've got to stand clothed in the armor of God so you can stand against the schemes and the strategies and the plans of the power of darkness to come against you. But that's not enough. It's time for the church to rise up and take seriously the authority that Almighty God has given the church. We, we act like we're weak and anemic. Really? Really? You don't think we don't have the power to change some of this stuff that's going on? Yes, we do. Why do you think, why do you think that people at Ephesus went to the civil leaders and said, Wow! They are about to totally destroy our business. We got to get these people out of our city. They're turning it upside down. It was because the church understood their authority. Read what was going on in Ephesus. They literally had witches and warlocks running to the church, bringing all of their stuff, and they were burning it, and they were converting them from spiritism to the Holy Spirit. They were turning that city upside down because the church knew the level of authority the church had. And I'm saying to you, we have the authority. Jesus has given us the keys. The gates of hell cannot withstand us. We open those gates and we plunder hell to populate heaven for his glory. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Rise up. What would happen? What would happen if each of you took seriously praying over your neighborhoods and you started prayer walking and taking the authority of Jesus' name over your neighborhoods? What would happen? Seriously, what would happen? What would happen if you took seriously Doing warfare for your workplace. In your closet, you would take seriously doing warfare. But don't say that. Well, I pray for them. But are you sharing with them? Yeah. See, it's not enough just to in our heart and mind to believe that the word of God is infallible, inerrant. We got to live like it is. Yeah. So our life has to match what scripture says. We can't just believe it in our mind and then be going out and hooking up on the weekends. We can't keep that in our mind and then go out and, and, and party until we're drunk and then drink and drive. Come on, guys. We, we've got to live it. We've got to believe it. We've got to live it. And then we pray, and then we've got to share it. We've got to tell people about Jesus. We've got to tell people about Jesus. We've got to pray for people. When people at work are talking about, oh, I got this knothead kid, and he's just going to devil, and da 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 they stop and say, can we, would it be all right if I prayed for you right now? Could, could, I, could I pray for your son right now? 
Come on, we got to take it serious. And, and i got to tell you, the majority of you are looking at me like I have two heads. <laughs> and the only reason is because the church has stopped being the church that Jesus established. We've got to start being the church that Jesus established that takes seriously the power of prayer and the power and authority that we have over the powers of darkness and we stop compromising the word of God, we start living the word of God, and we start walking in authority, and we start taking the authority against this stuff that's going on in our nation right now. Would you stand with me? You look like I just punched you in the jaw. I got a question for you, and I mean this sincerely. Online, I mean this sincerely. Is Jesus Christ Lord of hosts? Five of you believe that. The rest of you, I hope you'll get in the Word and find out. That was not a rhetorical question. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of hosts? Yes. You really believe that? Does Jesus Christ have all authority in heaven and in earth? Yes. You really believe that? Yes. Then why are you letting the devil beat up your family and beat up your life? And I can't tell you how many times when my kids were growing up, God would whisper to me about one of them that they were going through a struggle. And I'd slip out of bed. I'd go down and I'd pray, sometimes all night long, warfaring, literally fighting the devil for that child. I didn't lose my kids. So thankful. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I was not a perfect daddy. Just to, you can ask my kids, they'll tell you that. <laughs> and, and there were times that, that, that they didn't always agree with me. But I didn't lose my kids. Satan didn't get my kids. Amen. And I'm not letting them have my grandkids either, by the way. Amen. There are more times than I can tell you that I get up in the night and I pray for my grandkids right now. Amen. And my kids. I'm still praying for my kids. we got, we got to take authority. we we got to believe it we got to believe it, that when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth, and then when he says to you and I, I give you the keys of the kingdom, what he is saying to you, I'm giving you authority over the powers of darkness. Do not let the authority of darkness beat up your family. Don't let the authorities of darkness be the one in control of your workplace. Don't let Satan have your neighborhood. Amen. Come on. Amen. Take it seriously. Let's go to war, church. This last message in this series on spirit-filled living, I am saying to you as a church, I want us to rise up and take it seriously, and let's not just come and sit in church and worship and sing great songs, but let's be a church that makes a difference in our cities. Take it serious. Someone online right now, the nation where you live, Satan is plundering your nation. And I'm saying to you, begin believing God, that God can raise up and he will send angels to fight against those powers of darkness. Do not let him have your nation. Do not let him have your nation. Come on. Come on. Be the church. Be the church. Father, right now, in the authority of Jesus' name, We are saying as a church family that we are standing and we are believing righteousness will be exalted 
in Echo, in Stanfield, in Hermiston, at Hat Rock. It's going to be exalted in McNary. It's going to be exalted in Umatilla. It's going to be exalted in Oregon. It's going to be exalted in Boardman. It's going to be exalted in Arlington. It's going to be exalted in Lexington. It's going to be exalted, Almighty God, throughout the Butter Creek area. We are going to see righteousness exalted because, Lord Jesus Christ, you are bringing a mighty revival of your Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, we pray now in the authority of Jesus' name that this craziness that's been going on in the streets of our cities, that it will stop now in the authority of Jesus' name. We bind those powers of darkness that are animating this, and in Jesus' name, we render them bound, and we're, Lord Jesus Christ, your mighty angels to go and to beat back those angelic angels of darkness and for us to seize peace and safety come to the streets of our cities again in Jesus' name. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will begin a mighty rain that will start on our coast and come across our state and a mighty rain that will begin putting out these fires now in the name of Jesus. Lord, send rain, send rain to put out the fires and purify the air in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father God, Father God, I bless these dear ones. I know they love you. I know they love you, and I thank you for that, mighty God. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit to strengthen them. Amen. Holy Spirit, strengthen them in the mighty power of the Holy Spirit as Paul prayed that they would be strengthened with all might in the inner man, in the inner woman. God, grant that to them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the dear ones worshiping with us online all across this nation, across Europe, and in Asia, Almighty God, I pray you will strengthen them, strengthen them with your Holy Spirit. Those that are worshiping with us on the continent of Africa, by the authority of Jesus' name, your Holy Spirit strengthening them. Bless them, Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Come on, church, let's give him praise. Come on, let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise you, Lord. 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 Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. All glory and honor and praise to you. You have redeemed us by your mighty hand out of every nation, out of every tribe. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Don't you love our Lord Jesus Christ? I know you do. I love you. It has been so great to worship with you today. Man, my heart is encouraged by your worship your response. I love you. I pray God's grace strengthen you this week. God bless you. Have an awesome week. I look forward. If you can join us Wednesday night, study. You can join us in person or you can join us on Zoom. If you want to join us on Zoom and you, you, you don't yet get the email about that, if you call the office this week, give them your email address. We'll make sure you get the notice on Zoom to have the, the connecting information. God bless you. Have an awesome week.